A mansion in a Hollywood subdivision You get the fame on the one condition You get copied at the clone center You've put out some very strange tweets of late About cloning mm -hmm. What is it about cloning? Do you, do you want to get cloned or are celebrities getting cloned? Um, yeah man, I think people should look it up man I, I don't really want to say too much But I will say uh, do your own research They kill them with a common in it Overdose from a drug addiction same story, same headline A stroke, a heart attack, an aneurysm Celebrities and politicians Just to name a couple members You sound and, like a conspiracy into, theorist I'm not really a conspiracy theorist There's no more conspiracy I know, I know And so it's, it's really up to each person To do their own research and, and come to your own truths You know what I'm saying? Because I feel like we as people Listen too much to what somebody tells us and we don't actually go background check and really say, hmm, you know what? That really don't add up. Ritual some pedophilia, sacrifices, blood religion. The Queen of England got arrest warrants for the disappearance of a dozen children. Do your research on the topic. The same time every year, kids come on missing. Why do they lie, Mac? Why do they lie to us? Tell me. Keep you from knowing what you are. What we are? What are we? Oh, man, why do I gotta be the guy who tells the kids there's no Santa Claus? You're clones. You're copies of people out here in the world. What? Clones? What? Copies? What are you talking why? about? Why? Some hag trophy wife needs new skin for a facelift, or one of them gets sick and they need a new part. They, they take it from you. Don't people care that they kill us? That they take parts from us? They don't know. They, they think you're vegetables simmering in a jelly sack. Why do you think Merrick has you stuck in an old military bunker below ground? He doesn't want anybody knowing the truth, especially not your sponsors. Sponsors? The people that had you made. They like own you. Well, we're going to continue our discussion of the uh, concept of human cloning today. Joining us in our studio and testifying on the Hill today is Bridget Boisselier, who is scientific director for a private company called CloneAid. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Sure. Tell us uh, first what CloneAid is and what the company is working on right now. Okay, so CloneAid is a private company. We founded that four years ago, got the fundings to really have lab uh, last August. And so now we have three scientists working uh, almost full time in a lab here in the United States with the major goal for us to, to produce a human embryo by human cloning. Why do you want to do it? There are several reasons. The first one is that why am I doing it myself? It's just because I think I I had to do it four years ago when I hear when I heard all the the uh, establishment saying this is so bad and all these things. I said I have to do it and show that this is only a baby, a little baby, the belated twin of an individual, and that's it. It's not a monster. It's not all you know what we have been hearing so many bad things about this baby, and. Uh, so we decided to, that, to do that four years ago. Now we are on the verge to have this first embryo. And when do you suspect it will happen? I don't want to be rushed into saying a uh, date. What I'm saying is that we are in the process of doing it. We will check every possible defect before, so we'll need to uh, make sure that the, the embryo is per completely viable and uh, before doing any implantation. So the soonest we could have an implantation is mid-April. It could be in a year from now because we want to make sure that uh, this baby is completely and perfectly healthy. As we did, yes. I also get asked a lot, am I a clone? Um, from my understanding, Donald has seen a clone of me in the cloning center. I am memory suppressed, however, I do have memories of what fit the description of the cloning center and the arena. Some people say, are you controlled opposition? Why are you just not talking about cloning? Why are you just not speaking up on these things? You're right to think that, but take this into consideration. If you're familiar with my song, Missing, Dr. Aiden, The Watchers, uh, my new black mixtape, you know that this is not my first time speaking out. I'm just now learning about cloning. Like I just found out about it a couple months ago. 
and I was scared as fuck. When I first found out about cloning, I mean, I was fucking terrified. Like, supernatural shit was happening around my house. I was jumping out of my sleep, seeing shit. I got all types of knives and guns hanging out of my mattress and my pillows and shit. Like, I had to beef up my security. I was really ter scared for my life. I literally had to face the fear of death. I thought that when I spoke out about cloning, they were going to kill me. Like, I swear to God. Oh, mama. The first time that I contacted Donald, there was a tremendous amount of interference. I mean, the footage got distorted. There were helicopters and planes and shit flying over my house. Airplanes. That song was written and produced before I ever got a hold of it. It was actually intended for Lupe. Y'all gotta understand how this shit work in this industry. Like, this shit is all set up. Like, talk to Lupe about airplanes. He'll tell you. Shouts out to Lupe. And also, too, y'all need to uh, pay attention to these other celebrities when they're leaving hints. They're leaving clues all over the place. Everybody can't talk. Everybody can't talk because, you know, they got kids or, you know, they made some type of agreement. But pay attention. Everybody who's in this shit or, or who's in this industry or who has a clone is not evil or malicious. Some people just got born into this shit, like me. So I'm still here alive. I don't know why. I don't know why I can talk. Um, maybe it's because I have some type of amnesty. Or maybe it's because somebody extremely, extremely close to me is a mason. And I'm protected in that sense. I don't know. But if they wanted to do something with me, I wouldn't have even gotten this far to telling y'all about cloning. So to the people telling me, Bob, I fear for your life, y'all don't worry. I'm in good hands. Just continue spreading the word. Okay, it's time for another episode of Synthetic Intelligence and the Transmutation of Humankind, A Roadmap to the Singularity and Beyond. This is a book we're reading by Wes Penray. We're down to Chapter 13, Genetic. Genetic Laboratories, at Atlantis Revisited, and we're down to the section titled How Cloning is Used on Humans. And it's been a little while since I made a video here. It's, um, it's just the way it is, but we'll pick up here and um, see where we get. When we think of cloning, we think of a person standing next to us being our exact copy. According to our special AI prophet, Dr. Ray Kurzweil, cloning mainly means cloning body parts in order to achieve immortality. Science wants to clone young cells from individuals which will make the body look and act younger. After having shared Kurzweil's anal analogy with the decaying house earlier in this chapter, let's now explore how it's done scientifically. In very simple terms, they take a blood test and look for a young cell in the blood and use it to clone an entire organ. This organ can then be rejuvenated remotely via the nanobots in the bloodstream, and the patient now has an entirely new organ that is young and functioning well. When body parts break down, don't think that they will be replaced by metallic robotic material, as we've learned from Hollywood movies. Becoming a cyborg is slightly different from becoming a robot, in a technical sense. Instead, they will, as explained above, be replaced with a younger version of that organ that will look identical to the original organ, but will be much more vital. However, once the organ's been cloned, it is kept under control by nanobots, which are kept in control by the superbrain computer once it's implemented. Nanobots can also self-replicate, just like biological cells. We need to understand that these scientists are helping the overlords to incrementally diminish the power of the fire, soul essence, in the body by replacing our cells with nanobots. Each cell in the body becomes a certain quantity of fire, which in conjunction with all other fires in the body in other cells, keep us vital, emotional, and unique. 
nanobots lack all this and are 100% artificial. Eventually, after X number of years, each cell in your body has been replaced and you become your own clone without your own life energy and thinking capabilities. The super brain computer does all that for you. Ask yourself, where did the fires go once every cell in the body is replaced with nanobots? As the expression goes, they went out the window, or to put it in Kurzweil's words, my emphasis, by that time we're approaching the singularity, with the real revolution being the predominance of non-biological intelligence. A human being is a biological computer, which can house a soul billions of small fires. The life expectancy of this biocomputer cannot exceed 120 years, according to science. By then, the vital body parts have begun to malfunction and the body dies. By exchanging body parts, science can extend life considerably, and with time, the bo person's body goes back in time to when it was, let's say, 25 years old. If body parts will only be cloned when they are old or sick, it will take a few hundred years, perhaps, before the entire body is replaced, and in the meantime, the person will be classified as a cyborg. When the entire process is completed, we don't have a cyborg anymore, but a complete artificial body, built up by nanobots instead of biological cells. The justification for exchanging cells with nanobots will be that nanobots don't deteriorate. Cells do. People will start finding this to be acceptable, logical, and rational. Once the entire transformation of cells is done, we have a being that is totally taken over by AI, and there is nothing left of the original soul fragment that is still conscious. The soul, mind, body will still be there, but asleep for an eternity. Because people are unaware of what a soul, mind, body is, they cannot perceive the long-term danger with AI and the singularity. The AI prophets will protest and say that you will feel more vital when your body parts are replaced, not less. This is true, but what, it, what is it that makes you feel vital? Is it the rejuvenation of body parts, or is it the energy being pumped into the nanobots, giving the soul an increase of energy, added remotely with technology? They will do anything to keep the illusion alive until the singularity is a fact. Another question is, will the overlords actually wait until people's last organs fail in order to be replaced, or will a day come when people are told that it's easier to replace all organs at once and become young again altogether, rather than wait for each organ to be exchanged? Again, the latter will most likely be the case. If so, post-humans might not remain cyborgic for very long. It will only be a short phase in their development. Now, however, we're getting into something really creepy. Okay, the next section is how cloning is used on animals. Most people have seen or heard about the movie Jurassic Park. This movie was made not only to entertain, but to reveal what, a, what is happening behind the scenes. The movie was about a scientific team that was recreating dinosaurs the way they looked and behaved hundreds of millions of years ago. They succeeded, but the consequences were of course very scary, and members of the science team were killed by the beast. Another great concern was that these dinosaurs would be able to leave the park in which they were contained. In his book, Dr. Kurzweil reveals that he finds it very exciting, not only that scientists today are working on cloning animals of endangered species in order to keep them from becoming extinct, but that they were also working on recreating already extinct species. This is where science really has gone mad. Once they can do this, and I believe they already can do it and are doing it, which species do they want to revive? Dinosaurs? The Smilodon, the saber-toothed tiger? In cer certain terms, it doesn't matter which species they plan to revive or prevent from becoming extinct. If we start with the latter, 
a species becomes extinct because of environmental changes, whether these changes are man-made, natural climate changes, or catastrophes. Animals and even plants are more intelligent, which is commonly understood, but more than that, they are highly intuitive. If an animal species feels that it can't survive well in a certain reality, they vacate and change realities to one that can accommodate them. These days, it is, more often than not, we cr humans who create a hostile environment for many animal species and plants. Hence, we are the ones who need to change in order to naturally keep the endangered species. It's not the endangered species that need to be changed or saved. The same logic goes for already extinct animals and plants. They are extinct for a reason, and calling them back to life will greatly disturb the balance of life on the planet. If we do call back a few species from the past, we then need to continue reviving more and more species to safeguard the survival of those we already revived, and even terminate some of the existing ones in order to get a balance. We can also Leave it to nature to take care of it once we're done experimenting mindlessly with genetics. But will that lead to sim symbiosis we wish for? Certainly not. I see no benefit in that. For example, dinosaurs or smelodons once again are the top of the food chain. Even if scientists were more modest <clears throat> in reviving a lost species and perhaps stretch it to reviving more peaceful animals, the balance of nature will still be disturbed. So, how will this all end? It will end in the exact manner as it did in Atlantis, when Inky's bizarre creations roamed the earth, wreaking the most horrible havoc. It now seems as if history indeed is repeating itself. I also want to emphasize that when I mentioned the dinosaurs and the Smilodon, I probably wasn't exaggerating. Indeed, Dr. Kurzweil tells us in his book that back in 2001, scientists were able to synthesize DNA from the now extinct Tasmanian tiger, and they are hoping to bring this, this species back to life. Kurzweil actually writes that if they could, they would probably revive dinosaurs too. Even if an animal species were hunted down by humans until extinct, nature has now adjusted to an environment where that particular species is vacant, and to revive it, perhaps 80 to 100 years later, will create unwanted results. Also, as I said, the extinct species has moved on to another version of Earth, hence no species ever becomes extinct. It only switches realities. Alright, the next section is more on genetic manipulation. In his book, Kurzweil also brings up stem cells. It is not necessary to take liver cells to create a new liver. They can actually use pancreas cells, for example, to create a liver and vice versa. This has already been done, Kurzweil wrote back in 2005. The reason they can do this is because there is no significant difference between the two. They both stem from the same DNA. Another thing they are experimenting on is how to solve world starvation. Scientists tell us they no longer have to slaughter animals and put pesticides in them before they sell the meat. Instead, they can clone animal muscle tissue and from one single animal produce billions of pounds of meat. They don't clone the entire animal, only the parts that people want to eat. Dr. Kurzweil and his team are anticipating that once this technique is out on the market, and meat prices decrease substantially because of this inexpensive way of producing food, people will embrace stem cell research and love the results from it. They believe that the resistance that, they, that may exist today is just a result of ignorance. But once people begin to realize the remarkable results from cloning and AI research, this resistance will break down. In terms of human cloning, Dr. Kurzweil does not see any moral, ethical, or philosophical problems with it because the clone will be a totally different person, more so than a set of twins, he says, which inevitably makes me think of Dr. Joseph Mengele's experiments on twins during World War II. 
Although Dr. Kurzweil gives us the impression that cloning techniques, when it comes to humans, are in our best interest and only for rejuvenation. Of course, he does not mention that the same cloning technology has been in use for decades in order to create clones of VIPs, such as presidents, politicians in public view, celebrities, and other people who are considered of importance. We sometimes call them doppelganger, a German word for double commuters. In addition, the military has abducted people, cloned them, and put the clones out in society to see if anybody will notice. Now we need to remember that during the time we have been cloned and rejuvenated, our bodies have been full of nanobots inserted into our blood system in many different ways mentioned earlier. It's the nanobots, not the cloned stem cells, that make AI work with the human body. There are those who claim that AI is sentient and has its own intelligence, separate from anybody and anything in this universe. Hence, when it manifests, it has its own willpower. This is a stretch, I would say. I agree with those who say that AI is ancient. It was present in Atlantis and way further back than that. However, it's not sentient by itself. AI is created from beginning to end by the overlords, the controllers of physical reality. AI is programmed to be sentient, something we humans can do to some degree already, as has been shown in this book. If we can do that much, what are, are the overlords fully capable of? Others say that AI has taken over entire galaxies and are spreading to new galaxies to invade those as well. Although there is a grain of truth in that, it's actually the overlords who are spread out across the physical universe, and AI is their invention and their tool in order to control other civilizations in their empire. Now consider this, and here we have Dr. Kurzweil again, quote, As important as the bio biotechnology revolution discussed above will be, once its methods are fully mature, limits will be encountered in biology itself. Although biological systems are remarkable in their cleverness, we have also discovered that they are dramatically suboptimal. I've mentioned the extremely slow speed of communication in the brain, and as I discussed below, and it says in parentheses, see page 253, robotic replacements for our red blood cells could be thousands of times more efficient than their biological counterparts. Biolog biology will never be able to match what we will be capable of engineering once we fully understand biology's principles of operation. The revolution in nanotechnology, however, will ultimately enable us to redesign and rebuild, molecule by molecule, our bodies and brains and the world with which we interact. These two revolutions are overlapping but the full realization of nanotechnology lags behind the biotechnology revolution by about one decade." Unquote. Dr. Kurzweil continues a few pages further into the book, and this is quite chilling. Quote, Although biological proteins are three-dimensional, bio biology is restricted to that class of chemicals that can be folded from a one-dimensional string of uh, amino acids. Nanobots built from diamondoid gears and rotors can also be thousands of times faster and stronger than biological cells. A particular impressive demonstration of a nanoscale device constructed from DNA is a tiny biped robot that can walk on legs that are 10 nanometers long. Both the legs and the walking track are built from DNA, again chosen for the molecule's ability to attach and detach itself in a controlled manner. The nanobot, a project of chemistry professors, Nadrian Seaman and William Sherman of New York University, walks by detaching its legs from the track, moving down it and then reattaching its legs to the track. The project is another impressive demonstration of the ability of nanoscale machines to execute precise maneuvers." Unquote. There are apparently still people who believe that AI has already failed. 
Rodney Brooks, the director of the MIT AI Lab, is quoted in Dr. Kurzweil book as follows, quote, There's this stupid myth out there that AI has failed, but AI is everywhere around you every second of the day. People just don't notice it. You've got AI systems in cars, tuning the parameters of the fuel injection systems. When you land in an airplane, your gate gets chosen by an AI scheduling system. Every time you use a piece of Microsoft software, you've got an AI system trying to figure out what you're doing, like writing a letter, and it does a pretty damn good job. Every time you see a movie with computer-generated characters, they're all little AI characters behaving as a group. Every time you play a video game, you're playing against an AI system, unquote. And that was Rodney Brooks, director of the MIT AI Lab. There's one more thing I'd like you to read before we leave Dr. Kurzweil for now and move on to see how much of what he has predicted in 2005, which is actually happening at this moment, 11 years after the book was first published. The following quote is quite long, but very important because it explains, in a layman's terms, the evolutions of the AI superintelligence. Please read the following carefully. Quote, Runaway AI Once strong AI is achieved, it can readily be advanced and its powers multiplied, as that is the fundamental nature of machine abilities. As one strong AI immediately begets many strong AIs, the latter access their own design, understand and improve it, and thereby very rapidly evolve into a yet more capable, more intelligent AI, with the cycle repeating itself indefinitely. Each cycle not only creates a more intelligent AI, but takes less time than the cycle before it, as is the nature of technological evolution or any evolutionary process. The premise is that once strong AI is achieved, it will immediately become a runaway phenomenon of rapidly escalating superintelligence. My own view is slightly different. The logic of runaway AI is valid, but we still need to consider the timing. Achieving human levels in a machine will not immediately cause a runaway phenomenon. Consider that a human level of intelligence has limitations. We have examples of this today, about 6 billion of them. Consider a scenario in which you took 100 humans from, say, a shopping mall. This group would constitute examples of reasonably well-educated humans. Yet, if this group was presented with the task of improving human intelligence, it wouldn't get very far, even if provided with the templates of human intelligence it would probably have a hard time creating a simple computer. Speeding up the thinking and expanding the memory capacities of these 100 humans would not immediately solve the problem. I pointed out above that machines will match and quickly exceed peak human skills in each area of skill. So instead, let's take 100 scientists and engineers. A group of technically trained people with the right backgrounds would be capable of improving accessible designs. If a machine attained equivalence to 100 and eventually 1,000, then 1 million, technically trained humans, each operating much faster than a biological human, a rapid acceleration of intelligence would ultimately follow. However, this acceleration won't happen immediately when a computer passes the Turing test. The Turing test is comparable to matching the capabilities of an average educated human and thus is closer to the example of humans from a shopping mall. It will take time for computers to master all of the requisite skills and to marry these skills with all the necessary knowledge bases. Once we've succeeded in creating a machine that can pass the Turing test around 2029, the succeeding period will be an era of con consolidation in which non-biological intelligence will make rapid gains. However, the extraordinary expansion contemplated for the singularity, in which human intelligence is multiplied by billions, won't take place until the mid-2040s." In the above excerpt, we can see in more detail how things are planned to put 
to pan out by 2045 when humanity is meant to be ripe for the harvest. Okay, that's where we're going to stop for this time just for the sake of people's attention span and uh, all that. But um, hopefully you're finding this interesting and can see kind of all around you how this is being played out, how it's being implemented in one way, but it's in another way. One day it can look like it's all around. Another day it can look like it's not even happening, but uh, I guarantee you something along this line, if it's not 100% along this line, is happening, just being implemented, but who knows how it's going to work out. All right, so that's it for this time, and we'll talk to you next.